Okay, so what is a cell cycle control system? Well, first of all, what we want to understand that these events that take place within the cell cycle are highly controlled events. They are operated by multiple sensors and there are major checkpoints that detect internal and external signals. We will find these checkpoints at G1 phase, uh, in between the G2 and M, and also in the M phase. So when the little tiny baby cell comes from the pre-existing cell, it will undergo G1 phase and then it will have to pass through that restriction point. So the cell will be uh, checking its DNA, possibly for potential DNA damage and see if everything is all right. And then if it's bacterial cell, it will probably be uh, sensing in this, its environment to see if there is enough nutrients to be able to, to survive and reproduce. Um, and, um, and obviously, if the cell senses that there is DNA damage and it is beyond repair, that uh, the cell will initiate apoptosis. So um, the apoptotic pathways are going to be initiated. And then once it passes through that restriction point, the DNA is going to be replicated. And we can say here, this is the point of no return. The cell will have to go on and divide. Now, obviously, it's going to have to finish the preparation for division in the G2 stage, and then finally enter mitosis. And again, there's going to be another checkpoint. So what we're looking for if DNA is replicated correctly and replication is complete, and also check for DNA damage. When the cell enters the M phase, and you know how these chromosomes um, condense and they line up across the equatorial plate and then spindle fibers have to attach to the chromosomes. So the, the highlight here is whether or not these chromosomes are attached correctly to the spindle fibers. So those kinetochore fibers will have to pull and separate the sister chromatids. So we want to make sure that everything is uh, separated correctly and non-disjunction does not occur. So, um, so that is a major checkpoint in here. So now the question is, what are these molecular activators for entry to each phase? And the answer would be protein kinases. I'm sure you guys remember protein kinases. We discussed them extensively in a previous cell signaling unit. These were the proteins that were able to phosphorylate other proteins and um, send the signal. In other words, uh, initiate the phosphorylation cascade and target particular protein to activate it or um, inactivate it, depending on what the purpose was. So the kinases that are involved in cell cycle regulation are called cyclin-dependent kinases, CDKs. And uh, they're the ones that are going to catalyze the phosphorylation of particular proteins that are involved in cell cycle regulation. So kinases alone are not active. So they need to be activated by cyclins. So cyclins are going to bind allosterically to the kinases and activate them. So um, the amount of uh, CDKs uh, typically is, um, is the same. It doesn't vary across the cell cycle, but the cyclin levels are going to vary because cyclins are going to be synthesized and they're going to be degraded synthesized and then degraded. And if you look at this diagram, you're going to notice that we have particular cyclins for particular phase. So G1 S cyclins, S cyclins, and then M. And you can see if we start at the G1 phase, there's a G1 S cyclin that's going to activate that particular CDK. And then at the end of G1 phase, this particular cyclin is going to be degraded. And now notice the accumulation of the S cyclin. So the S phase, this is where the DNA is replicated. So it means the S cyclin is going to initiate uh, or activate the CDK. And then CDK will phosphorylate target proteins. And these target proteins will initiate DNA replication. So you can see this is um, a cascade of events that also happening here.
and then the M cyclin will initiate transi transition to the mitotic phase and then notice the M cyclin is degraded. So once again the levels of cyclin are going to vary across the cell cycle and then um, once the, the particular phase is complete the cyclin is going to be degraded. And just to point out a couple more things on this slide, we have MPF which is mitosis promoting factor and that triggers the passage into the actual M phase. And then we have anaphase promoting fact, um, um, anaphase promoting complex, or sometimes you can call it factor. Um, this is where we initiate the separation of chromatids which later become chromosomes. So now we're going to look at a very specific example how cells transition from G1 to S phase. So what needs to happen first is the, the growth factor that is sent by another cell. So you have to receive that signal or the cell needs to receive that signal and notice this growth factor um, initiates what we call RAS pathways. So these would be um, cell signaling pathways and they lead to the activation of the particular cyclin which binds to CDK and act activates it. So CDK will now utilize ATP and how does it do it? Is by hydrolyzing it. So ATP will be hydrolyzed and that phosphate group, that third phosphate that we get from the ATP molecule will be attached to retinoblastoma. So this protein, retinoblastoma, is typically an inhibitor of transcription. The, tra the genes that uh, typically trans that code for the S phase proteins. So a retinoblastoma is going to block this transcription factor E2F and then when the um, CDK cyclin phosphorylates retinoblastoma it undergoes conformational change and notice it dissociates from that transcription factor. So now E2F is free to turn on the gene to be able to transcribe the proteins that are necessary to begin the S phase, to begin that protein, uh, not the protein synthesis, but I'm, I'm sorry, the DNA synthesis in the S cycle. So to summarize this, the flow or that transition, we need a growth factor which will initiate cyclin synthesis which will activate the CDK and then lead to cell cycle events and in this particular case we're looking at phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein. So think about if this protein was um, defective. Let's say you had a gene that had a mutation and that coded for this protein to be defective and I'm going to say defective in a way that it cannot bind to this particular transcription factor. So what do you think would happen in this cell? So it cannot act as inhibitor of E2F. So yes, yeah, so it means this particular gene would be able to ex would be able to be expressed constantly. So it means the proteins that initiate that S phase would always be there. So that means we probably would be looking at a cancerous cell that would constantly divide. So this leads to the topic of cancer. So cancer is a disease of cell cycle because cells, uh, cancer cells, they reproduce and they no longer respond to cell cycle regulators. And uh, normal cells, they grow, they rest, divide, differentiate, and then they undergo apopto apoptosis if needed. Um, but cancer cells, um, they sort of escape these rules and uh, in the end they destroy and they can destroy the organism. And typical cells, normal cells will be very organized, will have a specific shape, will carry out a specific function and cancer cells, notice the, they are very uh, different in, in size and shape and some of them will lose the normal functions and they are very disorganized as far as the arrangement and they have or they form these poorly defined um, boundaries. So cancer cells also show no contact inhibition. So normal cells in a petri dish will divide until they form this monolayer, uh, while cancer cells will pretty much pile on top of one another and that's how the tumors form because they show no contact inhibition. So 
they are very self-sufficient for growth. They can produce their own growth factors. And if you remember, uh, part of the signaling, the autocrine type, where they actually re release their own growth factors and stimulate their own DNA replication and then cell division so that they can continue to, to divide. And then they also, they also have telomerase to be able to extend the telomeres. They are, as, as I mentioned before, they are insensitive to cell cycle signals and they are less prone to undergo apoptosis and they have the ability to induce angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels. Because think about it, if you have a tumor and those cells in the center of that tumor, they need to have clear access to oxygen and nutrients that are delivered by blood. So they will make their own blood vessels to tap into these major blood vessel highways so that they can, so that they can survive. And then they have the ability to escape from their home tissue, meaning they can metastasize, especially malignant cancers are able to do so. And generally speaking, they are very genetically unstable. They continue to accumulate mutations and such. Um, now, how does cancer arise? I mentioned before that cancer is a disease of cell cycle. So um, basically, cancer does not arise from one single mutation a cell has to accumulate a number of mutations over time to be able to initiate um, all those cellular abnormalities within them. And um, cancer probability increases with age because that means those cells have divided many, many more times. And every time the cell divides, DNA is replicated and you can have that mutation happen within that particular cell. So here we're looking at a mutant cell. And then after one round of replication, now we have another cell. Then this cell um, has another mutation. So after cell proliferation, now we're looking at this particular cell with three mutations. So this is the actual dangerous cell proliferation. This could be potentially malignant cancer. We do understand that genetics have a lot to do with whether or not an individual develops cancer and these are called cancer critical genes that can, uh, when they are changed, altered or mutated in some form, they can lead to a cancerous cell. So we have these oncogenes that code for oncogene uh, proteins. So typically these proteins are positive regulators of the cell cycle, but sometimes when they are overexpressed, that means it will speed up the division process. An example would be a growth factor receptor, which is a protein, and that protein is sitting within the membrane of um, breast cancer cell. So there it's called HER2. So normal cells would have, um, would have a few receptors, and they would receive specific um, growth factor signals. But cancer cells, express many more receptors and they're going to be very sensitive to growth factor. So therefore they will respond to the growth factors accordingly and they will initiate the division process. So it means this cancer cell will begin dividing uncontrollably and form a tumor. There are also tumor suppressor genes and normally they are the ones that are going to slow down cell division. Uh, they are also involved in DNA repair mechanisms and they initiate apoptosis. And in cancer cells, those tumor suppressor genes are typically inactive. And as the American Cancer Society states that the most tumor suppressor gene mutations are acquired and not inherited. So give you one example. Um, example of retinoblastoma, which is a protein that acts at that restriction point at the very end of G1 phase. So when retinoblastoma proteins are active, the cell division does not proceed because remember, it actually binds to transcription factor and then this transcription factor is not able to transcribe certain genes to initiate DNA synthesis. But if a person is infected with HPV virus, which uh, causes to make a protein, and that protein is going to inactivate the retinoblastoma, and therefore now the cell cycle is going to proceed uncontrollably. So the cells are going to divide. Um, there are also environmental factors 
And so environmental factors would be cigarette smoke, air and water pollution, exposure to UV radiation, chemical compounds that we consume and such. So anything that can induce DNA damage is called carcinogen, and that can lead to cancer, and also mutagen, that specifically uh, mutates the DNA. And we also know that about 15% of cancers have been linked to viruses, bacteria, or even parasites. So most of the causes of cancer are still not known, and researchers are definitely working on it to discover these factors. One tiny little note that I wanted to add here. Remember how I mentioned that cells, when you have a little tiny ba baby cell that comes from that pre-existing cell, they are going to undergo G1 phase. Sometimes cells are going to be entering what's called G0 phase. So this is that resting, quiescent state, or sometimes we call that state extended G1 phase. I'll give you an example. The red blood cells and also neurons, because you know neurons do not divide, and red blood cells are enucleated. Their nucleus is removed when they leave um, the bone marrow. So it means red blood cells cannot divide, so they will be sitting in that G0 phase, and they cannot return to the cell cycle. Although both of these cells are metabolically active. So a lot of students always ask me about the neurons. They say, if neurons do not divide, how come some people get brain cancer? And um, this is a very complex topic, but just to summarize and give you an idea, um, there are other cells in the brain that are actively dividing. Example would be glial cells. So those glial cells can give rise to tumors. And also, certain tumors can metastasize into the brain. So the question is, was that the primary tumor or metastatic tumor? So this will complete cell cycle, mitosis, and cancer notes.